Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network. You could also find me on theconsciousresistance.com and theseedsofliberty.com. So today we have Rand Eastwood, who is an anarcho-capitalist, voluntarist, uh, and a liberty operative. Um, he runs randeastwood.com, and uh, he's a he's a founder of a few Facebook pages: Rand Eastwood Blog, Evolve. Uh, Liberty and Leviathan, as well as the Sovereignitarian, um, and you can find him on Twitter at Rand underscore Eastwood. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about a few of his articles um, that he wrote on his website. Um, the most popular one was the fundamental flaw in non-anarchistic libertarian thought, and another one is um, anarchy equals order and government equals chaos, uh, and another one uh, is anarchist. The New Abolitionist. Um, yeah, so, I mean, there's another one. Private policing, law enforcement, and adjudication of stateless society. Uh, if we get to that, that would be wonderful, but uh, I'm sure we'll have uh, quite a bit of uh, <laughs> material uh, with those. Uh, so, Rand, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Oh, no, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I've uh, been following you on Facebook. Um, you know, I saw you uh, share some of my articles occasionally, and... Um, and then, uh, you know, I'm like, wow. And, you, and I also see, you're, you know, you're a writer as well. Um, you know, I'm also a little bit of a writer, although I've been getting more into YouTubing and podcasting recently. Uh, but uh, yeah. it's always wonderful to see uh, fellow writers. <laughs> and I try to promote, you know, other, the work of all the vol- voluntarists and uh, anarcho-capitalists as much as possible, right? So, yep. the, uh, how do they say it? The, the rising tide uh, raises all boats, right? So that's, yes. that's, that's the way I see it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so maybe we'll start off a little bit uh, with the, your background. I like to to get the background of all my guests. Like, um, how did you come to anarchism and volunteerism? Um, you know, what was uh, uh, what was your path like, and and what um, books inspired you? What what podcasts or or personalities uh, inspired you? All right, I can tell you exactly when I became a libertarian, and that was 1994, actually technically probably 1995, but Newt Gingrich, the contract with America, the Republican Revolution. You were probably about 12. <laughs> so I don't know if you remember 1995, that. 1995, I was 13. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I don't know if you were really, if you cared all that much about what was going on, but no. <laughs> I was I was young. I was about 30. Uh, I was young and, and ignorant, and I listened to Rush Limbaugh. And I... Uh, Hate to admit that today, but I'm not too hard on myself because there's millions of ignorant people that listen to Rush Limbaugh. Right. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, I guess I wouldn't have called myself a conservative Republican, more of a small government, lower taxes Republican, pro business Republican. And what Rush was saying made a lot of sense to me. And so I participated in that Republican revolution. Uh, and that's where they swept. I don't know if you remember it all, but they. They swept both houses of Congress. They got some state legislatures and governorships uh, with Newt Gingrich and the contract with America. And it was funny because the next day, it was when I lived in Indianapolis, uh, the newspaper had like two or three inch block type big headline across there that said, a grand old time for the GOP. And I had a picture of myself holding that newspaper up. I was so proud. Yeah, we did it. We did it. <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, I brushed my hand and leaned back and watched, and, and guess what happened? Nothing changed. Utopia. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nothing changed. It was amazing. So that is what actually sent me looking for some. I said, there's, you know, it's not a two-party system. It's a one-party system. There must be some alternative. There must be something else. And I started looking around, and that's when I discovered Libertarian Party. Mm. And their philosophy and principles made a lot of sense to me, and that led me to Ayn Rand and Harry Brown. And I, I read both of Harry Brown's libertarian books, which was uh, Why Government Doesn't Work and How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World. But really, the book that really changed me was uh, Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal by Ayn Rand. Uh, that was... That's like diametrically opposed to everything you've been taught mm-hmm. in an authoritarian society, status society. Mm-hmm. And the way I try to explain it to people, it's like I was reading this book that's telling me 
the sky is green. The sky is green. Trust me, the sky is green. I'm going, it is not. You know, I, I really had a hard time grasping because it was so foreign what mm. she was talking about there. But as I was reading and forcing my way through it, I was like, you know, the sky looks kind of green. And and, <laughs> and so that, that really educated me on that front. And uh, so I started, I basically became a libertarian and... Uh, one thing led to another. I, we talked the other day that I met Harry Brown during his 2000 presidential campaign mm. as libertarian candidate in Houston. So I met him. I have a picture of that. That's one of my fond memories. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then I kind of dropped out because I went through a divorce and was struggling and wasn't paying attention to politics. But when I got back into it about five or six years ago with social media and everything making it so much more effective that uh, and, and and the Ron Paul campaign so I, who's this Ron Paul guy so uh, I, I, I started becoming a lot more active because before the internet and before social media I mean, who are you gonna tell I you know I would talk to my coworkers or whatever but I say yeah whatever you know but on social media and the internet, you know, I can reach thousands of people now. I do reach thousands of people every week through all of my efforts. So it's actually got a little bit of a payoff. And everybody started talking about liberty all of a sudden. It became, you know, in vogue. And I've been talking about it for 20 years. I'm all like, right. hey, you know, maybe I, can, maybe I can teach some people some things. Well, I ended up getting taught myself because... Uh, you were saying personalities and stuff. I ended up. I started. I started watching uh, Stefan Molyneux, Jeff Berwick. Uh, I I've I followed Larkin Rose. I've heard of him for quite a while, but started following him more closely, and uh, it all started making more and more sense. Uh, you know, Jeffrey Tucker says, "What's the difference between a libertarian and an anarchist?" Oh, about six months. Mm. That took took a little longer for me, but you know the the uh, the logical end to libertarian thought would be a stateless society. And uh, when I came to that conclusion myself, uh, and I started to notice the rift online between you know constitutional libertarians, limited government libertarians, and anarchists or voluntarists. Uh, that's I, I really started looking at it. So you know, why is there this disagreement between the two? And and I pegged it on in in that article, um, the fundamental flaw of non-anarchistic libertarian thought is that, uh, like for instance, Peter Schiff is a libertarian, but he'll say, and I've seen him say it several times. Well, we got to have government. You know, mm. you have to have government. And Jesse Ventura, you know, you got to have government. Yeah. And uh. You know, he had, he talked on, Ventura was on uh, Adam Kokesh. Well, that's another one I started watching was Adam Kokesh. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they started debating the stateless society or, or you, you know, do you have to have government? And, of course, Kokesh just body slammed him. Like I said, if it was a <laughs> WWF match, he threw him out of the ring. It's Ventura's, you know, and, and that's one of the things that Ventura did what most people do is they say, well, how's it going to work then? How are we going to do it without a government? You know, like right. you're supposed to come up with all these answers. Right, right, right. And I actually addressed that in the uh, the uh, private policing, law enforcement, adjudication, and stateless society. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll get to that later. But uh, I noticed that here's the problem: is the the limited government libertarians, the constitutional libertarians, haven't accepted the reality that you can't limit government. That's that's the whole problem. That's the fallacy in the argument. They say, well, you gotta have government for this, you gotta have it for protection, for policing, for courts, you know, these supposedly legitimate things that government does. But nobody ever stops to think, wait a minute, no matter what we've done in the history of mankind, the government has never stayed limited, you know, because mm. who's gonna limit it? You know? <laughs> yeah. They <laughs> They write and interpret and enforce the laws themselves. Obviously, they're going to get out of hand, mm -hmm. and that's what I say. The American experiment was proved once and for all. And here we had 
some of the brightest, most intelligent men in the world got together at that time and said, how are we going to do this? And they came up with a pretty decent system, but it still didn't work because you can't, can't limit government. So that's, that's what I talked about in that article was, was uh, the fundamental flaw is that you can't limit government. You shouldn't expect to limit government when you're giving them the monopoly on law enforcement and law interpretation and writing laws. Obviously, they're going to do what's in their best interest eventually. And, and, and it's, 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 it's a combination of human nature and what, what, what's called institutionalization. And that is sort of a macrocosm of human nature. And that is that people generally act in their own self-interest. So even the individuals who work in government are going to be doing what, you know, what's in their best interest. And once an organization of humans, a company, a government, an association, whatever, becomes institutionalized, uh, what that means is it it becomes its own reason for existence. It becomes its own priority because these people are vested now. They got their paycheck. They got their pensions. They got their insurance. You know, they want to send their kids to college and they want to, you know, so it becomes in their best interest to promote the company's best interest or the institution's best interest mm -hmm. because they want the institution to carry on because they've become dependent on it. So government's no different in the free market when a company becomes institutionalized and it becomes the the people, the workers in the company begin looking out for their own best interest, which is human nature, and the institution as a whole starts acting in its own best interest instead of the interest of the members or the customers or whoever it is that came into existence to serve, then you get this slow death spiral where they start losing their customer base because they're not, you know, they've lost sight of the goal you don't you don't perpetuate yourself. You you serve the customers, and that perpetuates you. But in the government's case, they don't go out of business. You know, they don't. Mm -hmm. If they quit serving the people, they just keep quit serving the people. You know, and and so that you know is, I think, the cause behind it. But that's what I tried to identify in that article was libertarians still believe that somehow. We're going to limit government, and state, you know, voluntarists have realized that that's not going to happen. If it didn't happen this time around with the Constitution and everything, and everything they did to try to keep the government in check, and it, it's totally, you know, it's worse than any government has ever been. You know, it's just monster. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's what that article was about, and I summed it up by saying, you know, instead of when statists come to us and they say, well, how's this going to work? How are we going to do, you know, without, I like to preface the whole thing by saying it's not that we won't have the services that government supplies, that the state supplies. It'll just, those services will be provided by private enterprise working in a, in a free and open marketplace. But then, you know, people want examples of how this is going to work How you know, how are we going to do policing? How are we going to do all of these things? And like, we're supposed to, you know, predict 20 years down the road how that, you know, <laughs> right, and, right. but I think we should turn the tables. I don't think that's the right question because, well, as soon as they start hitting us with that, like we're supposed to have all the answers before we try anything, I think we should ask them, well, instead of me trying to speculate how everything's going to work in the future, how about you tell me how you plan to limit the government? Right. Exactly. You know, we should just turn the tables and say, you want limited government? How are you going to do it? You know, well, we'll write up laws. Well, we tried that many, many times. So I just think that we should quit trying to explain ourselves and make them explain themselves because they're the ones that have 200 and some odd million right. citizens that have exactly. been murdered by government in the last century on their hands. Exactly. And, oh, that's the best we can do. I don't think that's the best we can do. <laughs> that's, 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 uh, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> sorry, that's the best we can do. Right. Yeah. Well, that doesn't even include wars. I yeah, mean, that's exactly. just governments killing their own citizens. Mm -hmm. It's it's. Mm -hmm. I looked it up. The numbers vary between like 170 million and 230 million. Mm -hmm. So I park it at 200 million. I guess that's enough. Right. But, <laughs> Sufficient. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, 
don't want to split hairs there, but <laughs> uh, and that doesn't even include wars. That's right, just right, right. governments killing their own people. Right. And in, in a century, that's just one century. Mm-hmm. That's the the uh, what would that be? The twentieth century, and that's supposed to be like. The biggest century of human advancement and civilization and everything, it's, mm-hmm. you know, in human history, mm-hmm. and yet we have 200 million of their own citizens that the state has killed. And, you know, and, and evidently statists say, well, that's, you know, that's just the cost we pay. That's the best we can do. I don't think it's the best we can do. So, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting. Like, um, you know, you, you do look at that number, 200 million you know, 20th century, and, you know, it sounds dismal. And then what's amazing, I just I just thought of it, is that um, in the 20th century, that's when the population has exploded, right? <laughs> to, what, almost 8 billion today. And it's yeah. like, despite yeah. all of that democide, right, and mass murder, it to me, it shows the resiliency of the human spirit that despite... The insanity, <laughs> right? And uh, that's a good point. The insanity of their government. Yeah. They have outbred <laughs> the, their, their, <laughs> outbred the, the the murdered, you know, brothers and sisters. Yeah, yeah. I bet the elite really do look at us like a bunch of cockroaches. <laughs> it's like, man, those guys. They just keep breeding. <laughs> but yeah. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. So, and and the other thing you were saying about um, you know, difference between government and and um, and private enterprise is, I think it was Albert Einstein. He says, um, you know, if you know, don't it's you don't if if you want to succeed, you know, you shouldn't think about making money. You should just think about providing value to people, right? Because right. that's basically what all it is, right? That's how that's how you create a successful business is you create a product that people want to give you their money for. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. That's that's the fundamental flaw, and yeah, I. I just learned that within the last few years, I really started studying economics and finance uh, as part of this whole thing in the last few years. And, and uh, that was a, a realization I just came, you know, you think about how can I make money? How can I make money? Right, you know, how exactly, can I, whatever. Exactly. And, and that's the wrong, yeah. <laughs> you know, the, mo- the money, the money is, is how you gauge how well you're doing. Exactly. <laughs> you know, serving people. Exactly. That's what it is. It's you know, money is just a gauge. Yeah. So, uh, you know, trying to. That's what I focus on now is try to. Well, I try to be the best person I can be. Right. Right. Uh, uh, you know, be the change, exactly. and uh, and then I I try to figure out you know what can I do to provide value to other people. Mm. Uh, so yeah, you're exactly right. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, and and to me, yeah, you're right. Capitalism uh, is about serving um, the customer, serving your neighbor, right? It's like um, uh, you know, you can't you can't um, move forward if you don't have the customer's first, you know, um, you know, priorities in mind, right? You just you just can't. Right. <laughs> it's all that's what it's about. It's about voluntary exchange, and once you lose yeah. sight of that, you know, you will be. Uh, you will lose customers and you will lose, you know, your your profits and you'll go under. There's just no way around it. If you want to resort yeah. to theft, you know, then you're no longer you're no longer a private business. You're you're a fraud. <laughs> right. You know, right. they say fool me once, you know, shame on me, fool me twice, shame on you. Right. Yeah. It's like you can only screw people out of their money how many times right. you know until right. right. you run out. Ponzi scheme, you start running out of new people to to take their money. So yeah, yeah the you know, yeah, and and then going uh, back to your idea of uh, of limited government um, being uh, so so absurd, it's like um, I think it was Rothbard. He said, um, you know, the people who advocate for limited government, it's like give give the government all the power and all the guns, and then say limit yourself, <laughs> 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 right? A, 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 yeah, a, as if as if that's uh, you know such an easy task. <laughs> But like you said, you know, they view, right. I, I think the, the um, you know, the political class, they rule they, or they see, they view the people as, as, you know, tax cattle, right? As um, well, yeah. serfs, yeah. right? That produce 
and you know produce things of value that that you know they're parasites right that they just siphon off the productivity of the industrious right and you know the political class they don't produce right. anything nothing whatsoever right they, right in, in, and then they and then they use the they use what they steal to buy votes from the right. lower classes right you know the welfare state right but you know but what we're seeing now is is the ultimate demise of that you know yeah. the the parasite the tumor yeah. Mm-hmm. Grows and grows until it kills its own host. I mean, right now they're they're grabbing for any any money, any power they can get because they're gonna, you know, mm-hmm. they're out. I yeah. mean, we're we're out. We can't. They're broke. Right. So yeah, they're just gonna keep growing until they can't be supported anymore. Yeah. I think that's typical evolution of of the state. Yeah. And, any parasite. And the and, and you know you're also talking about your um you know your evolution um towards the discovery of volunteerism in your own life um and they kind of brought to mind that volunteerism to me is a philosophy of li- of humility because in order to progress to where we are today right most of us went through government school we were all indoctrinated into the statist paradigm and we all had all these uh you know you know three branches of government and you know <laughs> yeah it's necessary right and you know it's just drilled into your head right pledge of allegiance all this kind of stuff and so you have to have a massive amount of, uh, of humility, intellectual honesty to examine those things that were drilled into your head and then, you know, take them apart one by one and <clears throat> re-examine them and then come to the conclusion, you know what, they really don't make sense. When you put them under the microscope of logic and, uh, and reason, right. they, they fall apart. <laughs> yeah, well, for me, it was more natural. Uh, my, my nature... I, I was getting in, in trouble when I was a little kid. Um, <laughs> I've always been called a rebel, but I would call myself a self-thinker. Uh, but even as a little kid, I think back now, and I would get in trouble. I'd get an idea in my head, and I'd just start doing it. You know, it didn't, <laughs> it didn't occur to me to ask somebody's permission or whatever. Right, right. You know, if it, if it was somebody, if, if it legitimately involves somebody, say I had to borrow a tool from you, hey, can I borrow your hammer? But, you know, I, I don't ask from an irrelevant third party permission, hey, is it okay if I do, you know, I would just start doing it. This right. just was my nature. I right, just, right. Uh, so I, I, in, as a kid, I was getting in trouble with my parents. And I wasn't really doing anything wrong. That was what was confusing. It's just, I didn't have permission to be doing it, or I wasn't doing what I was told, mm-hmm. or I wasn't doing something the way I was told to do it. It was all <laughs> this, you, you know, right. <laughs> you know, all this irrelevant stuff. But right. isn't it cool? I made a, you know, whatever it was. And, <laughs> That's besides the point. And, yeah, <laughs> but that haunted me. Of course, you know, in church, and then I went to public school. Man, <laughs> I almost didn't survive that. That was bad. Yeah. Uh, I made like straight A's the first couple of year, years, and then I lost interest, and then I was just in trouble all the time. Mm. I was always reading a book or something instead of listening to the teacher. <laughs> in trouble and, reading a book, that's funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I started to get in trouble, and oh, then oh, man, oh, man. in junior high, I started, I started recognizing, I didn't know at the time what it was, but I re- recognized the politics of mm. what was going on, the favoritism, the... You know, that they were judging you not based on your work, because I always did great work, always got good grades, but they were, I was always in trouble because I wasn't obeying them, I wasn't subservient, I wasn't conforming, I would do things my own way, and, well, that isn't how we told you to do it, but yeah, but isn't it cool? You know, it's just, I couldn't, so I started seeing the the politics and the, and the, favoritism, the, the students that teachers liked or the students that behaved themselves, you know, yeah. were treated di- treated differently. Mm. Then I started really getting in trouble. I started talking back. I started, I would say anything. If I, if I started getting in trouble with the teacher, yeah. would single, single me out for something, <laughs> I would say whatever I could to make them look like the biggest fool in front of the class that I could. And that didn't usually help my my case at all. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then high school, the only thing that saved me in high school was um, art, basically. I went, I went into music, I started playing drums, I went into photography and newspaper, and so I'm, I'm writing, I'm photography, dark room, and music, playing drums, and so I dropped everything that I didn't need to graduate, and my days were filled up with these things I actually had a genuine interest in, and that 
kept me afloat until I barely graduated from high school. And then, of course, the same thing followed me into my employment. And see, this is all kind of new to me. It took me till I was probably 45 years old before I figured out what the I thought there was something wrong with me. I thought I was just insane or something. <laughs> so then I'm going to these jobs. I'm in trouble. I do great work. I do twice the work as the other people. I have all these great numbers. The customers love me. I'm in trouble all the time because <laughs> I'm not following the rules. And I'm not, I didn't have, I'll fix something, something that's been broken for two weeks, causing all these problems. So I'll fix it. I get in trouble. That's not your job. You know, <laughs> what are you doing that for? Who told you you could do that? I said, well, my brain told me I could do that. <laughs> so, yeah. So I had the same problem in my jobs. It's all this, our whole society and culture is just saturated in this authoritarian, mm -hmm. this authoritarianism, you know. Somebody has to be in charge of every little thing, mm -hmm. and then you're supposed to obey all this stuff. And, you know, so you do all this great work, and you're fixing things, and you're increasing efficiencies in the system, and you're helping everybody, and then you have a review, and they say all these, say, oh, well, great, great scores on all this, and then they say, well, we see here that you were one minute late three times last month, so you don't get a bonus this quarter. <laughs> you know, just things like that. You know, these things that are totally <laughs> irrelevant in my mind. I, are you serious? <laughs> you know, and I don't smoke, so I don't take breaks, and, and then I get in trouble for skipping my breaks. And it's just crazy. Wow. It's just, it's <laughs> yeah. It's like every place I work, they're so intent on just following all these rules, right. and nobody cares about the work you're doing. So I never, I never could... I had the same problem all the way through, and it wasn't until, you know, recently that, you know, when I started really looking into the philosophy and stuff behind Austrian economics and and liberty and, and, and rights and, and voluntarism and just all these things, it all made, like, it's just natural for me. Oh, well, yeah, that's the way it should be, you know, and it isn't that way, and that's why, you know, I just go do my thing and think, you know, I think it's a free country. Mm. So, and it isn't. So that's, you know, once I figured that out now, since I understand what the problem is, mm -hmm. I, I, I work, I work around it. You know, I just circumvent, just, you know, I, of course I'm self-employed now that helps a lot, but, yeah. <laughs> you know, so it was, it was in my nature in the first place. And so the first time that I looked into something other than, you know, Republicans or whatever, whatever the political process is and, and discovered the Libertarian Party and that sent me and it was just like a magnet, you mm -hmm. know, steel to a magnet. It just, you know, this is what I've been saying for 30 years and everybody just thinks I'm a nut or a rebel or whatever. And mm -hmm. so, you know, going back to your, uh, you know, you said how you get in trouble at jobs, that kind of, it kind of made me think of, you know, the businesses themselves and how much they're restricted and strangulated by government regulations. Oh, yeah. Right? And laws. Oh, yeah. And like you said, mandatory breaks. You're like, well, what if I don't want to take a break? No, <laughs> take your break. Yeah. Or else I'm yeah. going to get sued or get in trouble. You know, right? Yeah, I'm working on a project and it's, and it's lunchtime. So I work through my lunch. Right. What am I going to? I got to, okay, I'm going to stop. <laughs> I'm going to walk for five minutes to the break room. I'm going to sit there and eat a banana. <laughs> You know, I don't smoke or anything, and, and then wait, and then clock back in, you know. So I would, or what really would get me in trouble is after the shift, I'm, I'm in the middle of some big project, I've been working on it all day, and it's almost done, you know. So I work over for 15 minutes to, you know, finish this up or help somebody else finish something up, and I get in trouble. Okay, you, you can't be working over, you know, we can't pay overtime. Well, of course, that's the state's fault, yeah. but so then... The next time it happens, I'll go ahead and clock out, and then I'll finish up for 15 minutes off the clock before I go home, and I get in trouble for that. You can't be working off the clock. You know, it's like you can't right. win. It's like they want you to do anything but work, you know. Right. And, and so you look at it, you know, the like you said, all the, all the government mandate regulation, but then you've got placation of employees, which has just gotten completely out of hand. Mm -hmm. I mean – you know, you look at somebody sideways, they sue you. You right, know, right, right. what is this wrongful termination? It's like, mm -hmm. you know, the guy cutting my grass sucks, so I fired him. That's wrongful termination. You could fire him for any reason. You know, right, it's right, right, right. it's not a contract. Yeah. So, so you got 
you know, and, and that's what you're seeing in customer service now. If you think about it, a, a business today in this country, its first priority mm-hmm. is to satisfy all the government mandates and regulations and right. licenses and fees right. and make sure you're keeping so they don't shut you down. Right. And then you've got employee placation. You know, you've got to coddle everybody, make sure you don't get sued, pay, you know, with the minimum wage and all that debate, pay above market rate, you know, all these paid for benefits, paid time off, all this stuff you got to do for the employees mm-hmm. so you don't get sued, mm-hmm. you know. And so, and then somewhere in there, they got to squeeze out a profit so they could stay in business. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, fourth or fifth on the list is customer service. Right. I mean, the customer is going to fall all the way down there now because that's just where it's going to be on the totem pole. So, it, you know, and, and when you have a minimum wage wiping out half the workforce, mm. you know, instead of having, you know, 10 workers at $5 an hour, they've got six workers at $8 an hour. Mm. Uh, so you go in any place now that's retail and everybody's running around, there's hardly anybody working there and all that. So, you know, I think that's why, uh, for the most part, customer service has gone out the window because companies are, <laughs> they got to take care of the government and they got to take care of their employees first. So, yeah, I think one way to, um, you know, I describe government uh, in general is being uh, one giant broken window fallacy. Because, <laughs> like, uh, you know, you know, just, I mean, I mean, from the individual point of view, you know, just taxes taken out of everything you do and your income tax and all that. And then from the business point of view, from the entrepreneur, um, you know, the the most expensive uh, thing that he has to take care of first is taxes and, and also diverting. So diverting, you know, capital towards, uh, you know, these uh, th- right. thieving bureaucrats and then and then and then diverting his, um, you know, energy and effort towards complying with all these regulations. Right. Right. <laughs> and, that, right? And, and, and that's that's diminishing your ability to create your product or service. Right. Right. You know, and all those costs get passed along. Right. And and that's one of the things, I'm glad you bring that up, because that's one of the things that I try to do in my writing. Because, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not an economist. I'm not a constitutional scholar. I'm not a historian. I, I talk and write about things that make sense to me. And maybe that's why a lot of people really enjoy my writing, is because I it's, it's very simple to read. I make real simple points. Right, yeah. But, uh... One of the things I like to try to do is to point out the costs. I like to run the numbers and point out the costs of things because it's all hidden. You know, people don't understand what this, uh, not only on a, you know, from a liberty and, and a social aspect, but but uh, financially, what it really is costing you to have this. You know, uh, one article I wrote on my blog uh, back when the FDA was threatening to shut down, I don't know if you heard about it, they were sh- threatening to shut down the ch- the uh, uh, artisan cheesemakers. Uh, really? <laughs> they, they, for thousands of years, <laughs> cheesemakers have aged cheese <laughs> those on these e- wooden... Those, those evil cheesemakers. <laughs> yeah. Like they got, well, what are we going to find to pick on now? Cheese! That's that's what the, the problem with the world is today, is cheesemakers. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, here's the thing. Well, you know what it is. It, is, it, it, it turns into a control thing, just like oh, everything man. else. They go, well, you got to do it our way. Right, right. You know, nobody, nobody's thinking about it. It's just... <laughs> Number one, it's a power thing, but number two is how can we make more money? You know, they're right. going to find these people. Yeah. Well, artists and cheesemakers for eons have used wooden planks to age their cheese on. Right. The FDA's coming, oh, that's not sanitary. There's no way you can sanitize a wooden plank. So they're like telling them they, they're, they're threatening to, to ban them, say you can't use wooden planks. And the cheesemaker's like, well, we can't make cheese. Yeah. You know, <laughs> that's how you make cheese. And... <laughs> <laughs> so I think they did end up backing off. It, it got online and everybody was. <laughs> but I I wrote an article that was that's called it's on my blog. It's called uh, FDA cut the budget, not the cheese. Right. <laughs> and <laughs> and the reason I bring that up is because I did some research and on the FDA and the USDA. Okay. Now here's two government unconstitutional government bodies. What what is their main? I mean, they have a lot of duties, but what is their main? Their their prime objective 
is to make sure our food is safe and healthy, right? Right. The Food Drug Administration and the and the USDA. So they're supposed to inspect the food. They're supposed to make sure every, you know that they're not poisoning us. Well, take a guess. What do you think their budget is? Annual budget. You won't believe it. The FDA. I looked it up uh, for I, both of them combined. I, I have no the idea, FDA. No idea. I think. I think the FDA ranks up there with the TSA. I think it was like eight billion. Oh yeah. Billion with a B. Mm. And the USDA was a hundred and something billion. <laughs> but the two, the two together was a hundred and thirty-six billion dollars a year. Uh-huh. Now, I like to break that down because billions and trillions don't mean anything to anybody. Right. That's a hundred and thirty-six thousand million dollars. Right. right. You know, we could we could hand a million dollars to a hundred and thirty-six thousand entrepreneurs and think <laughs> of what that would do to them. Right. <laughs> you know, we'd we we'd instantly have a hundred and thirty-six thousand more millionaires right. investing in the economy. Mm-hmm. So, and and they are charged with keeping the food safe. Mm-hmm. And. Keep the food our safe. food isn't safe that's the thing that's the thing that kills me you know it's making us fat it's making us sick it's yeah. killing us it's full of toxins it's full of poison right you know that's the only thing they're supposed to be so every year we're handing them 136 billion dollars to not do their jobs and <laughs> You know, and, and I don't think people realize. It's right. like, what could we do right. if every year we could hand out $136,000 million to people that are actually going to do something with it? You know, I said the same thing in my that podcast I was on, uh, Unfiltered Liberty. I talked about the TSA. Mm-hmm. I haven't written this article yet, but I want to. It's an open letter to the federal government. <laughs> Hire me. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and here's the thing. As I was looking at the TSA... They've been around for how long now? Uh, Since 14 years, 2001? Th- 13 years, 14 years, something like that. They have an eight, $8 billion a year budget. Whew, okay. Nice. So we're talking about over $100 billion we've spent so that they can catch how many terrorists? <laughs> uh I think it was zero. So I was, <laughs> I, I was, I was going to write a letter that says, hire me. Because I'll not catch any terrorists for way less than a hundred exactly. billion dollars. Exactly. You know, I you know, I'll I'll take a cool hundred million and I'll and I'll leave the country and I'll be sure not to catch any terrorists. You exactly, know, exactly. So we just throw all this money and nobody looks at it. And right. that's what I try to point out. Right. But back to your point is on more of even a local level, you know, doctors. You know, you ever notice, like most doctor's offices, you go in, you sit in a room, and the doctor's running around to each room. He spends five minutes with you, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, the last stat that I read said that the doctor has to hire five administrators. It, an office has to have five administrators for every one doctor to handle the government, the, you know, the regulations and mm. the mandates and, and the paperwork and all, <laughs> all that crap. Right. So he has to hire five people mm. just to keep the government off his back while yeah. he's running around and he can't spend any time, you know. Mm. And even deeper, one thing that people don't think even further is the other reason, you know, government regulation skyrocketed our health care right. to where nobody can afford it. So now we're using insurance for every little thing right. instead instead of just catastrophic. And now yeah. it's to the place insurance not even affordable. Well, that's because, <laughs> you know, the government's regulating it to the point that, you know, there's no innovation, there's right. all this bureaucracy, right. and the costs keep just going up and, and the options keep coming down. Uh-huh. And uh, the other thing you have to think about, you have to factor in that, you know, the doctor has to recoup all those, uh, what I call uh, artificial costs mm-hmm. that the government's pumping into the business. Mm-hmm. That's that's he has to charge you and me to pay for all his people to keep the government in check. But mm-hmm. the other thing is, a lot of people don't think about is medical school. He also has to recoup. Yeah, student student loan debt. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and why is the student? You know, why is the cost of the education so high? Right. Because the government got involved and scot and, and skyrocketed the cost of education, right. and so you know that's even deeper into the into the thing that that he has to he's paying hundreds of thousands of dollars to get his education to begin with, right. and that has to go. He has to recoup that into his fees. So yeah. now 
you know, none of us can afford to go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. So, but those are the kinds of things I like to point out and, and actually have numbers mm -hmm. and say, you realize what this is costing, right? you know, and cause people don't, they don't see it. It's invisible. I right. think. Yeah. The, um, you know, going back to your, you know, the FDA and food, um, I saw a meme, um, where you see, you see the ingredients list, you know, enormous amount of ingredients, right? All complex chemical names and oh, yeah. you know, very long and, and, you know, preservatives, you know, um, you know, artificial flavors, artificial colors. <laughs> it says without the government, who would keep, uh, who would keep the food safe for us to eat? <laughs> well, well, thank you. Cause that was my meme. Oh, was that I yours? I created that. Oh, yeah. That, yours? that was awesome. <laughs> yeah, that was... I remember that. <laughs> uh, be before I started Evolve, which is really more strictly stateless society, right. but all that kind of stuff was on my sovereignitarian page. Excellent. That's and I, I was making these memes without government. There'd be riots in the street. I have a picture of all these police officers beating people in the street. You know, well, yeah. there's a riot in the street, but it's because of the right. government. Right, right, right. And, and then, you know, here recently when the EPA poisoned that river... I think it was in Utah. Mm -hmm. uh, did you see that? The yeah, EPA yeah, yeah. dumped, I heard, I heard about that, yeah. just destroyed that river. I, I can't remember. Right. Yeah, I got an aerial photograph of that river yeah. and said, without government, who would protect the rivers? <laughs> okay, it, went, <laughs> it went viral, man. It was shared all over the place. But yeah, that's what I did. I went and I found, you know, a Google image. I found a label that had all that <laughs> chemicals and and colorings and all that you can't even pronounce the words nope. of who would keep the food safe right and that was the point of my article cut the budget not the cheese is right. like you know i don't know about you but when i have a job to do and i'm not doing it then usually i get fired but you know <laughs> exactly they'll come to me and say you really need to be doing your job <laughs> they're not going to they're not going to continue to hand me 136 billion dollars every year right. and say oh well you know people are dying but you know <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. Not, not only would you so. continue working, you'd get a you get a bonus, you get a raise. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, working for the government. But but yeah, uh, you get a raise, full pension, right? You know, free benefits for your whole family. <laughs> and then and then the way that works, I don't remember where I was reading it, but it was talking about bureaucracy. You know, bureaucrats don't want to do any work. Right. So the first thing they do is they hire people under them <laughs> to do their work for them. Well, those people are bureaucrats too, right. so they hire people under them. That's why the budget always has to get bigger and bigger. Right, right. And then you just have this huge, you have the guy at the top giving an order, and then they give it to them, and they give it to them, and the right. order just goes down, you know, and it's just nobody ever does anything. Exactly. So, I, I um, you know, talking about, um, you know, how companies have to comply with all these regulations and how, you know, that destroys their... Um, you know, just diverse resources. I, I heard about, I was listening to the Tom Woods show today, and I heard about um, the Volkswagen scandal. Have you heard about this? I, I, yes. I just heard about this for the first time today. I couldn't believe it. And it's like, it's like the Volkswagen manufacturers, they, they programmed their computers so that right. the, the emissions would be, would like pass. Um, yeah, they cheated, they, they, basically. They, yeah, yeah, they would, they would pass the, uh, the, the, uh, the test, you know, to uh, get to get their certification, I guess. Or, or inspection or something for safety and then <laughs> once they go back to the customer the computer changes back to be more efficient <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah <normal>. so <laughs> so yeah i mean they so it, it's, it's 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 even better than that I'm, I'm trying to look it up now you know they were they were working around these ridiculous there, there's a couple of points i need to make i'm right. getting ahead of myself here i was going to find it they since then they've discovered there's like five other companies Five other car manufacturers that were doing the same thing. Now really? everybody's in trouble. <laughs> you know, it's anyway. Number one, if the car manufacturers have been cheating on the emission exams for all these years, on emission tests, mm -hmm. emissions, to get around the ridiculous government mandates, <laughs> and nobody noticed, then why do we have the mandates? That's the thing. It's like. It wasn't, nobody's going, man, what's with all this smog, you know? It's like, <laughs> right, exactly. it's like they, they only got away with it because they found out about it, not because it was causing any problem. Yeah. But, yeah, so, you know, it's like, what are you guys doing? So these, yeah, they were, they were getting around, look at Ford. You want to talk about government mandate, they stopped selling, talk about an icon of America, the Ford Ranger. Mm. They can't sell it in the United States anymore. Because the government mandates made it where they they couldn't do it profitably, so they you can if you want a Ford Ranger, you got to go to Europe or some I don't know someplace right. where they where they're allowed to actually allowed to sell their, you know their cars, and it's just 
it, it's crazy. It's just absolutely insane. So, yeah, yeah, it's really amazing how you know people really do think that if it wasn't for you know inspectors, I, actually, you know what? I have a um, I have a friend uh, who has a food truck, and uh, <clears throat> so he's an entrepreneur. He's got a you know a few oh. people working for him. And, you know, he's a chef, but I, I love talking to him because he really, um, you know, he lets me know how annoying it is, you know, to go and, and uh, sell his food. He needs permit for this, permit for that. Inspectors come. And so, oh, yeah. And so he, he really, he used to do farmer's markets, but now he just um, has avoided farmer's markets because all the permits required. <laughs> it's so annoying. <laughs> so he does mostly private, yeah. private uh, you know, events, private dinners, corporate events. Um, and he finds that so much better because you know. You mean uh, you mean it's like catering? Is that what you mean? Uh, well, he's a, or like he, he a like a street around. vendor. What do you? Yeah, like? I guess like a street vendor. He's got you know a food truck. He travels around. He, he I was going to say he's lucky he can even do that because that's like illegal in a lot of places. Yeah, or, yeah, or it's yeah. Re- yeah. It's real restricted, like uh, the taxi. You know, right, right, right. They only allowed so many. Yeah, you know, there might be too many street vendors out oh, there. Oh yeah, I mean so. ta- taxi is completely you know government pseudo monopoly but but uh yeah the street vendors they they are very um yeah yeah a lot of people don't like them especially the restaurants right they you know like one restaurant would say uh you can't sell you know within a radius of this you know this much around my around my restaurant and so they go outside of that radius and then they're fine until if another restaurant opens up they're like well you can't sell, <laughs> you can't sell around <laughs> my restaurant so they get kicked around and it's yeah. really sad and, and people you know, people really, um, they don't see how, like, you know, if there's more, if there's more variety, right, more vendors, that's right. even better. That's going Im- to, yeah, gonna you'll Im- reach an equilibrium between the market demand and the supply. You know, you're not going to get saturated because then the profits go down to where people quit entering the business. Right. That's what they say about taxis. Oh, if we didn't have a limit, there'd be way too many taxis. Right. No. There right. would be just enough taxis to fulfill exactly. the demand, and exactly. the price would be down, the service would be up. Yeah. Uh, but th- about restaurants, I want to I want to talk about that. One of the things I like to say that gets people interested is I say, well, you know, when you look at how our economy is just in the toilet, it's just crashing. And what I like to say is, as long as it's illegal to start or own or operate a business in this country. I imagine the economy is going to be in pretty bad shape. What do you mean it's illegal to start? Well, yeah, it's, you know, and this is the way I think. It is illegal to start, own, and operate a business in this country. And let me give you an example. Say we've got this guy named Joe. He's a, for a hobby, he cooks. Several years go by, he gets really good. He's got, you know, two dozen recipes. His friends love it. His family loves it. He's got really good. And he says, hey, you know, you know where I'm going with this. I want to, I want to open a restaurant. I got, you know, mm-hmm. so, you know, what's he do? He, he installs a, a commercial size oven in his garage and he clears out his, the living room and puts up a bunch of tables and chairs and throws a sign out front that says Joe's Diner, right? Mm-hmm. Well, what do you think is going to happen? The government's going to come and shut him down because oh, yeah. it's illegal, you know? <laughs> so just because you can do it, if you pay off the government first, it still means to start, own, and operate a business is illegal unless right. you, you pay the fines. You have to pay all the fines up front. Right. And, you know, but if you do it without that, if you, if you just start a business, they shut you down. It's illegal to do that. And then the other thing is, um, you, is zoning. Mm. You're talking about restaurants. Mm-hmm. You know, they zone and they say, well, you know, if you're going to start a restaurant or retail or whatever restaurant, it's got to be in this area that's zoned specifically for restaurants. Well, what does that do to the supply? I mean, it, 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 the supply of land where you can open a restaurant goes way down, mm-hmm. so the cost goes way up. Mm-hmm. That's why you and I can't just go out and start a restaurant because it costs, you know, half a million dollars, probably minimal. And you mm-hmm. got to get an investor or you got to get a franchise or something that covers all that up front. Mm-hmm. But anyway, so right up front, you know, you've drastically reduced the supply of property that you can put a restaurant on, which mm-hmm. sends the cost through the roof. Mm-hmm. And, and, and who pays for that? That all goes right into the cost of the product. You know, either the cost of their, their monthly cost to rent the property if they're renting or whatever, or, you know, they got to recoup the million dollars they spent because they had to put it in that spot. They mm-hmm. couldn't just, Joe couldn't just open his diner in his house right. or, or something. So even the zoning 
cost people a tremendous amount of money mm. and, and just not aware of it. So, yeah, yeah. And, you know, um, I, I go to this farmer's market near me and, uh, and it's funny, like, uh, last year I went there and, um, they didn't have any hot food, like prepared food at all. And then this year they started having prepared food. And then I was asking Uh-oh. questions. I was asking, Oh, wow, that's interesting. Why, why didn't you guys have it last year? And then the guy told me, well, the chamber of commerce said that if we were to have hot food, that would steal customers from the businesses in the town. <laughs> and so it would negatively affect them. And so in order to protect those businesses and their customers uh, and their you know profits, they prevented people <laughs> from bringing hot food. Isn't it amazing? And, and, I, yeah. and, and in, my, in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, so if a person wants to go to a sit-down restaurant, Right, have a you know appetizer, entree, and dessert, right, in nice comfort, right, and a right. nice, nice right. chair, and they are, um, how do you say, um, outcompeted <laughs> by a guy <laughs> in a farmer's market with a falafel. <laughs> what does that say about the value of your yeah. food in your sit-down restaurant? That, <laughs> that, that you know, <laughs> be, be, besides the the economic fallacy, well, we have to protect their profit, <laughs> right? But you're taking profits away from me, so you know it's right, it's right. an equal, you know, it's an equilibrium kind of thing. Taking the sales away from me and giving it to him isn't protecting anybody, right? You know, it's all the profit is all staying in the community. It's right. just, but you know, it's protectionism. It's yeah, it you know, is. Those 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 industries go in and pay for campaigns and stuff and get yeah. these people elected and then it's like well like taxi and Uber I'm always ranting and raving about the taxi industry and and Uber and yeah you know because they just now here uh, allowed Uber to come in uh, they actually banned it. it went to court mm-hmm. and the judge upheld it uh, because Vegas it's huge taxi limo industry here Mm -hmm. and and they they own the politicians and and so they they didn't allow they were actually they were actually pulling over uber drivers arresting them and finding them and confiscating their cars what it's like you know the the way i put it was like okay let's say let's say i'm looking for a tv set you know (laughs) i go on craigslist and or maybe a craigslist app on my phone and and you're selling a TV for a hundred bucks. Yeah. So I said, okay, let's hook up. So we meet somewhere, and you know, I I give you a hundred dollars, and you give me a TV set, and then the police break in the door, and they <laughs> they arrest you and confiscate the TV because you don't have a license to be selling TVs. You're not charging sales wanna, tax. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. And if if I want to buy a TV, I have to go to a dealer and pay full price right. at a retail location. You know, it's just. Because Uber isn't a taxi service; it's an app. Mm-hmm. It's peer to peer. You know, you say, "Hey, anybody got a ride?" In fact, I experienced something similar. I hired a guy on Craigslist uh, that had a pickup truck. I needed to move something. Mm-hmm. I got on Craigslist and found this guy that had a pickup truck, and I and I called him, and he he came over, and he said, "Well, what I do is I put the ad out for just like a day or two, and then I pull it down because they're cracking down." And I'm like. Hmm. Cracking down, cracking down on what? <laughs> it's illegal here to hire yourself out and your truck to do any kind of hauling or commercial anything with your pickup truck if you don't have the right permits and licenses and stuff. <laughs> I said, you got to be kidding me! You know, it's just and and they did the same thing. They uh, uh, what is it? Uh, Air Airbnb, some of those uh, rental right. places. Right, right. Okay. Okay. Um, those are places, short-term rentals. You can get a room or whatever when you're just traveling. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, Vegas has this huge hotel industry, yeah. and 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 that that peer-to-peer rental was was hurting the hotel industry because people are coming in and they're staying for a weekend at somebody's house and going on the strip. Is they're not paying these outrageous hotel fees, right? Right. right. So they actually they didn't outright ban it. They they regulated it out of business. I mean, you got to keep it under the table, but what they did was they passed a law saying you can't in your own house, your own property, you can't rent a room to somebody for less than 30 days. Hmm. Now, wow. Yeah. Really? So so like, you know, if if people are complying actually, then they're not going to be able to get these weekend travelers and stuff to come in for one weekend right. unless, you know, there's probably ways 
technically to get around it, but you know, it's the same kind of thing. <laughs> it's like, who are, who are you representing here? You know, people can save a lot of money. The people right. that live here can make a little extra money. And you know, my brother and I operate a pool service company mm -hmm. and a lot of the properties we have are rental properties. And that's how I found out about that is because they used to be leased all the time. We'd go in there to do the pool. There's new people there every week or maybe mm -hmm. two weeks. All of a sudden they're all vacant. And then I was talking to one of the managers one time. He said, yeah, they outlawed it. You can't, you're, it's illegal. to." So now he, they're talking about selling their property. They can't rent it anymore because mm -hmm. it's illegal to rent it for less than 30 days. <laughs> so, you know, you got to go get a hotel room on the, you know, and pay outrageous fees. Right, right. So, yeah. Yeah, it's really, uh, yeah, it's really amazing. You know, the um, the number of laws and it's constantly increasing, right? Number of laws, number of regulations, and you know, nobody knows the full extent. You know, no, you know, they say ignorance of the law is no excuse. <laughs> Who's who knows all the laws? Have you seen the federal yeah. registry? The politicians yeah. don't even know what they write, right? So everybody's yeah. breaking the law. Basically, everybody's a criminal. So basically, in that in that society, you know, if they want to target anybody. They can they, if they follow you long right. enough, they will find something that's, that's some obscure law that you have broken. <laughs> yeah, I am seeing a lot of things online about that, about you know, with the NSA and and everything you know that they're watching literally everything you do. Right. And it's not so much that they care what you're doing, but when you start getting under their skin, you start causing problems, and they're going to go back through and find something. They'll find something to charge you with, you know, to get you out of their hair, and that's. That's something to think about, you know. You, you when you're doing the kind of stuff we do, mm -hmm. you know, if, if it starts getting real popular, then all they have to do is is look at your online activity and find something. They what do they say? We break, we we commit three felonies a day or yeah. something without even knowing it. <laughs> yeah. You know, the they they pass laws without even reading them. Mm -hmm. You know, they say, well, I got 800 pages that came <laughs> on my desk three hours before we voted on it. <laughs> now, you. <laughs> I have a solution for that. You know, Rand Paul, he drives me nuts. Uh, the read, read the Bill Act, where they have to read, you know, it's like, <laughs> that's like the con the constitutional amendment to follow the Constitution. It's just, right. do, you, do you hear what you're saying? <laughs> you know, it, wh wh it, okay, so we're going to have a constitutional amendment that says they have to follow the Constitution. But anyway, <laughs> if, 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 if I was... A representative, you know, and I was actually upholding my oath to the Constitution and representing representing my constituency within those parameters. And a big bill hit my desk a day before we're going to vote on it. That's a thousand pages. You know what I would tell people? I don't have to read it to know that it's unconstitutional. <laughs> I'm voting no. You know, if it's <laughs> if it has anything to do with education or health care or drug laws or, you know, any of these things that are unconstitutional to begin with, right. I don't have to read it. It's unconstitutional. You know, we don't have. So that's that would be my solution if I was in. But yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, we just have to. I mean, that that's I think that's our job is is telling people that, um, you know, anarchy is not about um, uh, a lack of rules. It's just a right. lack of rulers. Right. Because there are always unwritten social rules in in um you know civil society that people respect right the you know i tell people we are surrounded by anarchy right you know the dating world is anarchy right there's you know what time you wake up what time you go to sleep the clothes you wear the profession you choose right. you know the people you want to date that's all anarchy nobody forced you to do that you know no, no government you're, official so you're, you're gonna make me do this <laughs> i i wrote an article a quick little article about that exact thing and I want to read it to you. It's like one paragraph, so don't worry. Okay. <laughs> it's it's called a day without anarchy. Nice. And it's it's exactly what you're saying there. I get these ideas. <laughs> uh, you know, they have to realize that, like a lemonade stand, that's anarchy. <laughs> you know, um, Craigslist. You know, well, yeah, trading, I, that's I, anarchy, I, right? <laughs> I was publishing those memes. I have a meme that shows a, a girl working a lemonade stand, and then there's all these kids that are lined up, following the rules. To get lemonade, I'm said this is anarchy. I showed a poker tournament. You know, everybody's playing cards. I, this is anarchy. Yeah. You know, there's rules. Everybody's voluntarily following the rules. Right. Here's here's that article, because somebody had said something, in something I was watching or something I read about how I think it was Butler Schaefer, and said we live just what you were saying. We live mm -hmm. our life, you know, as anarchists every day. I mean, we don't 
vote on everything. Mm -hmm. So here's, here's what I said. A day without anarchy. You might enjoy this. This morning, my brother showed up at my place, put a gun to my head, and forced me to go to work with him all day. At the end of the day, I put a gun to his head and forced him to pay me. <laughs> After work, I stopped at the grocery store, put a gun to the cashier's head, and forced her to sell me the groceries I needed. I then went to a local electronic superstore where a couple of thugs from Apple put a gun to my head and forced me to buy an iMac. But at the register, I put a gun to the cashier's head and forced him to also sell me a remote keyboard and trackball. On the way home, I was sitting in a traffic light when a homeless man approached me, approached my car, put a gun to my head, and forced me to give him a couple of dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Arriving home, my neighbor came over, put a gun to my head, and forced me to come over to her driveway and help her change a flat tire on her car. See, this is exactly how society operates on a daily basis. Every interaction between people must be forced at gunpoint, or at a minimum, under threat of violence. Otherwise, nobody would be willing to help each other or cooperate, and nothing would ever get done. This is why anarchists who believe that all human interactions should be voluntary, uncoerced, and free of violence, or the threat of violence, are simply crazy. <laughs> so, anyway, so yeah, nice. you, want, you want to make a point, <laughs> you know, when state, you know, anarchists, right, we don't, we... <laughs> We do, th we do the right thing generally without somebody having to put a gun to our head. The only time somebody has to put a gun to our head is usually when it's the government making us do something. Right. Paying our taxes or you know, making us get a smog check or whatever it is. Oh, yeah. Uh, but, you know, yeah, you, you, you put a gun, you sent somebody to my door and said, you're going to be on this podcast. <laughs> okay, okay. Exactly. You know, That's the only reason you so, came on. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I, you know, I'm just fear, abject fear for my life was all that it was, <laughs> you know. <laughs> right, I, right. I, I was really afraid, I was really afraid about the uh, seeds of liberty. I was afraid, of, of go, totally afraid of going, because there's three of you there. <laughs> <laughs> and you guys could just gang up on me and just beat the crap out of me if I don't come on that show. <laughs> but, <laughs> exactly. so yeah, on a day-to-day day -day basis, we do... We cooperate. We do the right thing. You know, there's no violence uh, until pretty much until the state gets involved in one way or the other, and then everybody's you know having to force each other to do stuff. Right. I mean, but how, how many people would you know when they're in the in the street? They say, "Oh, look, the police! Yay! Thank goodness oh, the police man. are here!" <laughs> Everyone's like, oh, run, "Run! The police!" Yeah, are you here. see, you Damn see a it. cop behind you on while you're driving. It's like, oh my god, you know, <laughs> am I going to get killed because I don't have a license plate light right, right you know whatever it is and uh what they pull that one girl over for uh a, a tail light was out or a license plate light or something the 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 black woman who ended up hanging herself or something she died in prison she oh, was a right, liberty activist yeah. i can't remember her name now i heard that yeah, yeah. uh you know and the there's dash cam footage right. where the guy is ordering her to do all these things that you know, their unlawful orders aren't things that he has any business. And when he he told her to put her cigarette out, it was like in the ashtray of her car. She's in her car, yeah. the cigarette in the ashtray. He's outside. And he said wants her to put her cigarette out. He's she said, you know, that's that's not illegal. I don't need to put my and that's when he lost it and dragged her out and arrested her and then she ended up dying, you know. So it's like it could be any little thing these days, they'll just kill you. Right. It's just crazy. Right. But, well, um, well, I don't want to keep you too long, but uh, before we go, um, please, um, can you plug your websites once again um, and see if they want to contact you or follow your work? How can they reach you? Okay. Well, I do most of my in-depth writing is on my blog, which is randyswood.com. And then I do a lot of microblogging on, on Facebook. Um, I have, I'm always open to friend invitations on or friend request on Facebook on just my profile, Rand Eastwood. I also have a corresponding blog page, it's Rand Eastwood blog. And because my blog, I don't just blog about liberty, I blog about a lot of things, I have philosophy and spirituality and psychology and, and science and technology. I blog about everything I'm interested in. A liberty, liberty is, and, and anarchy is a big part of it, but it's not dedicated to that. So if they're just interested in the, the, Liberty stuff. Uh, you can go to my 
Facebook page is Rand Eastwood blog, and then I have the Sovereignarian, which you mentioned, which really talks about. Uh, well, the slogan is uh, defending and empowering the sovereign individual. So it really focuses more on the power of the individual, the rights of the individual. I have Liberty and Leviathan, which the slogan is uh, exposing the true nature of the state and its impact on liberty and society and the economy. And that's really more I post a lot of news and commentary to demonstrate basically the failure and the damage of the state, you know, what the state really is all about the true nature of the state. And then my latest one, Evolve, which is dedicated to hopefully helping the human race evolve to a stateless society, a voluntarist society, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is the next step. Excellent. So, so I actually hold the opinion, some of the things I've written, I actually hold the opinion that it, it not only makes sense, but I think it's going to be necessary for our survival. Is we That's the next step. You know, under anything, under Aside from global government and slavery, I think eliminating the state is going to be necessary mm -hmm. for the survival of humanity, I think. Oh, yeah, definitely. That's the uh, mental illness of, of statism. <laughs> um, so so uh, something I'd like to ask of my guests is um, if you were to meet someone who's like on the fence about... Um, you know, anarchy or volunteerism and, you know, is critical of the government and, uh, you know, what would you, what would you tell them to completely abolish their belief in, uh, in statism? Wow. Uh, or, or even someone, even someone, let's say you met on the street, you know, and, uh, and, you know, you just have a short time to talk, you know, what, what would you say like a short soundbite to, convey the quickest truth to them? Uh, you know, I've never actually considered a question like that before. What would I say? <laughs> I run into somebody and I have one sentence to say to try to convert somebody. Or a few, uh, a few sentences. <laughs> you know, I, 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 don't, I don't know exactly what I would say, but I would probably... The best thing to do is to ask questions right, and let okay. them come to their own, you know. So I would ask them, so you think it's, you know, that violence is okay to use against violence against innocent people. Mm. Well, no, you know, you don't, you don't think that if you take money away from people that, that that's theft. Mm. Well, yeah, of course that's theft, you know. So one thing when, when people say paying taxes is voluntary, <laughs> one thing I do like to say is, okay, if you think it's, uh, or it's not theft. They say paying tax. You know, I say it's theft. Oh, it's not theft. Okay, <laughs> let's make taxes voluntary, and watch what happens. You know, <laughs> well, am I going to send thousands of dollars? You know, right. it would just drop like that. You know, so if it's obviously not voluntary, because if they have an option, so I don't know. I I think, uh, you know, I have a problem with taxes being theft, and I have a problem with with using violence and force to, you know, force people right. to do do or not do whatever it is. And so I suppose I would just, uh, I would ask them the question, so you think it's okay to put a gun in somebody's head and make them do what you want them to do mm -hmm. or, you know, something like that. And it, they would have probably a hard time justifying that when you really look at it. And right. people say, well, that doesn't happen. I actually got a guy tell me that, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm against mandatory GMO labeling. Right. I think it's a violation of, of the rights of the business owners. Yeah, it is. And, it is. And, and I was big, long debate with this guy, and he, and, he, and he actually said I was crazy. I said, all I can figure is you're crazy because nobody's going to go into their office and point guns at them and, and, and make them do it. And I'm like, that's exactly what they're going to do. If, right. if, if, if they mandated GMO labeling and a company didn't do it, mm -hmm. and they didn't do it, and they didn't do it, Eventually, men with guns are going to show up, and they're going to arrest everybody and shut the business down. So he's like, nobody's going to stick a gun to their head. And, and, and <laughs> for some reason, the government doesn't have guns. <laughs> yeah, about? they can't. They can't make that leap. Right. That the only reason that any of that happens is because they're sticking, pointing a gun at you. You know, yep. are you going to, are you going to obey? Are you going to pay a traffic ticket? If if you don't have to, you know, <laughs> you don't pay it. You don't pay it. You don't pay it. Eventually, right. somebody with a gun right, exactly. shows up at your house exactly. and takes you away. And oh, I guess I better pay that. So, so yeah, yeah it's the whole yeah. 
using violence on people and taking their money and property. Yeah, simply put, um, a law is an opinion with a gun. It's one of my favorite stuff I'm on you. Yeah, I, I, you know, before we go, I did want to touch on one other thing. I think this is important because it has to do with the future of a stateless society and when you're debating with people. Mm-hmm. And they say, well, how's this going to, you know, who's going to build the roads, whatever it is. How, how's this going to work? How's that going to do? How are we going to have courts? How are we going to have law enforcement? Mm-hmm. And the argument I like to use there, you know, at, at, at one point in time, nobody understood how man flight was going to work. You know, and and private enterprise brought it about, and it constantly gets improved throughout mm-hmm. the ages. But like, there could be a couple hundred of us in a room, and you could say, okay, who here knows how to make how to how to design and build a fifty-five inch flat screen TV? Hmm. Well, nobody, <laughs> nobody knows how to do that. But what we have millions of them around the world. Right. So then I, I go off. On, on the examples, the computers, the, the TVs, the satellites, the, the spaceships, the, you know, cruise liners, the, the Internet, yeah. all of it, yeah. you know, and nobody knew how that was going to work until they started working on it and trying it, mm-hmm. usually the private sector, mm-hmm. and, they, and they brought it about. So if you're going to argue that the stateless society, we're not going to try even try a stateless society because we don't know right now how all these things are going to work in the future, I think that's an invalid argument. That's what I call it. Of course it is. It's, like, it's an invalid argument, you know. Like, and if, if anything, the state slows down the progress of anything that we do come up with. Oh, Once yeah. it's regulated, it, it stifles innovation and mm-hmm, it mm-hmm. You know, throws the cost through the roof. And everybody has to – once it's regulated, everybody has to do it the government way. Mm-hmm. So how can, you, how can you innovate? That's why the, the health care and medication and everything has just come to a grinding halt. So that's what I that's what I like to t- to say to people, you know. Mm-hmm. Just because we don't know how private enterprise is going to bring these, you know, somebody brings up, you know, somebody starts a private police force, which they were doing like in Detroit. Uh, my article, private policing and adjudication of stateless society, has a whole list of example links to examples of private policing and 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 things. And you know, somebody starts a private police force, and you know, it operates for a while. They see what's good, what's bad. They start improving it. They get recommendation. They have problems. They fix it. Somebody else says, hey, I can do it better. They come up with it. You know, mm-hmm. so it's not like, okay, today we're going to decide how it's going to work 20 years from, because it's always going to change if it was voluntary. No way. If it always. was in a free market, mm-hmm. it's always going to change and improve to the marketplace. Right. So, you know, just not understanding how it worked today is no reason to not try it. Basically, what I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, it just to just to uh, show you know my interpretation of that argument is is the uh, the slave master asking the abolitionist, uh, "Tell me how the cotton will be picked without slavery." Mm-hmm. <laughs> right, and I tell people that the abolitionists were not uh, fortune tellers or oracles; they could not foresee the rise of the of the industrial machines that were that would harvest right. the crops right but they just opposed uh chain slavery on moral grounds alone right that you cannot uh own another human being right and right uh, right and that's basically what voluntarists and anarchists are today and it was and it was the advancements under capitalism that right. pretty much ended slavery everywhere else right it just became more economical to use machines than to, right. to use human labor exactly so, Yes, well. exactly. Wonderful conversation, Rand. Thank you very much. All uh, right. So this is. Um, so if anybody wants to donate uh, to my show, uh, you can donate uh, Bitcoin, PayPal, or Patreon. We have the links below. Uh, please support uh, me because this is a labor of love. I love doing it. I want to continue to do it. Um, and funds are very encouraging. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> you know, well. it's, a, it, it, it's, um, you know, I didn't start this to make money, but, uh, but it would be very encouraging to do so. And it would most, uh, I'd be most grateful and it would help me, uh, um, you know, find all the, uh, you know, these wonderful guests like Rand and uh, continue doing it. So, yeah, thank you very Absolutely. much, everyone. Thanks a lot, Rand. Uh, All right, this, thank you. Yes, this is uh, Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and thusheedsofliberty.com and theconsciousresistance.com. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. All right. Bye. Bye.